Hey, welcome back to Crimes and Closets. This is Christy in my closet in St. Louis. And this is Beth in my closet in North Carolina. Hey. Hey, girl. I am literally going to be hiding in this closet all day long. (laughs) Tell me. (laughs) Uh, Well, we have a snow day and I'm putting it in quotes because nothing has happened yet and it is 1145 my time. Mm. Um, I won't say nothing. There was a little bit that happened last night, but they still, in my opinion, could have gone to school maybe for half a day and gotten more done than what they're doing virtually. Okay. So... The um, two oldest, well, two oldest, I have my oldest and his friend are, is here, um, have to be on in class, like actually virtually for at least a short amount of time and do work. So they're, you know, doing stuff. But the other two just have asynchronous work and then can like pop online if they need help with something. Oh my gosh. Does it give you PTSD to have the kids on like computers doing school? <laughs> yes. Yes. Oh. Yes, it does. It does. Um, although I'm grateful that we now don't have to like make up a snow day because we've used all of ours because they can do it this way, but still, I don't know. Anyway, so my youngest, I basically have to tell him, like, here's your list of things to do. Go ahead and do this. So I told him, do you, watch this video, this video, and then sit on this Dreambox website for 30 minutes. I'm going to go downstairs and work out. That's easy, right? A simple task. Two videos that I had pulled up and then go on a website and play some math games, right? Simple. Okay. okay. Go downstairs. First of all, I'm running on the treadmill and I have a neighbor text me, how many miles am I running? Because my oldest had me on his camera and she saw me <laughs> on her oh daughter's camera. Oh my gosh, live. <laughs> you were live in the class. Oh live my in the gosh. Class, running on the treadmill. That's number one. Number two, I come up and I'm like, where's Langdon? Cannot find Langdon. Langdon, I'm over here. He's in with his computer inside the dog crate. With the dog. Uh, okay. With his computer on the Zoom call <gasps> with his teacher. Oh, no. <laughs> because apparently he couldn't watch those two videos and play on a, on a website for 30 minutes without help. <laughs> okay. And so he, <laughs> he thought he should her. call her and go inside the crate? I guess he's on this Zoom help. So I'm like, dude, what are you doing? He's like, well, I needed help. So I got on the Zoom call, you know, and... I'm like, what did you need help with? Wait, is this all during the call? <laughs> yes. Oh, uh, well, so after teacher. the fact, I realized he was still on the call with okay, his okay. mic on. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> so he's like, well, I needed help with a few things. And I was like, well, like what? <laughs> you were on Dreambox. I don't understand what you needed help with. <laughs> and then, and I was like, and I, I was, you could have come to help, like ask me. And he's like, well, you were working out. I didn't want to bother you. I'm like, you don't have to worry about bothering me while I'm working out. It's totally fine. Blah, 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 blah. Anyway, and then all of a sudden, he, like, lifts up his computer, and he was like, okay, bye. And he, like, hits the end button. I was like, oh, okay. So she just heard that whole conversation. (laughs) So So. essentially, you have made a cameo on your oldest's Mm -hmm. Zoom call in class. Yes. And Mm -hmm. your youngest teacher now thinks that you don't help him and keep him in a cage. (laughs) <laughs> pretty much <laughs> pretty much and then i just don't want bother me while i'm working out no matter what i cannot come down there <laughs> you scared of mom <laughs> can i have can i have wine yet <laughs> oh what a morning <laughs> yep i'll be here all day <laughs> Yeah. Oh my gosh. Maybe you need to go hide with the dog. (laughs) Well, I just gave him instructions before I came in to record. I'm like, okay, here's the two things that you have to do. You need to read for 30 minutes and you need to write a letter to your teacher. Like that's, those are your assignments. You can get those done. P.S. My mom does not keep me in crates. (laughs) Right. Exactly. Because he has to write what he's going to do all day today during the snow day. He's probably going to be like sitting in the crate with the dog. Because I can't bother my mom. <laughs> yeah. Bless I literally was like, do not get on the Zoom. She's not there. Don't get on the Zoom. <laughs> you can wait until I'm done to ask me any questions. <laughs> oh, my gosh. We better hurry. <laughs> oh, anyway. So there you go. There's my day. <laughs> it's really good. It's really good. Um, I'm sorry for you, but that made my day. <laughs> Well, I'll be laughing later when I'm drunk. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Oh, he does well, no, teach not. you that. <laughs> right around lunchtime, my mom poured herself a glass of wine. <laughs> she said it was my fault. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh my gosh. Oh, anyway. Okay. All right. Well, I mean, do you have anything? Do you, do you, do you no. got anything for me? <laughs> Nothing tops you, girl. All right. Well, so then do you want to hear about a crime? A sure thing. Let's hurry it up for the poor boy in the crate. <laughs> okay, here we go. Okay. Okay. So, you ready? I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. Okay. I'm ready. Have I asked you 15 times if you're ready? This <laughs> is a case suggestion from our closet sister, Stephanie. Hello, on Stephanie. Um, it's a tough one because it's unsolved and it's just super strange, sort of like Jody Lynn Newberry case oh. where she just like disappears in thin air and you don't have answers. Oh, no. So, spoiler alert. <laughs> This is the disappearance of Leah Roberts. Have you heard of her? No. Okay. I don't know why I insist on like knowing whether we heard this, each other's people. Because we need to know. <laughs> yeah, Love the name Leah though. I know. See, and didn't you did Leah, what's her name? I can't remember Leah her last Hickman. name. Leah Hickman. Hickman, yes. Mm-hmm. from West Virginia. Yes. <clears throat> this one's local for you. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Is Stephanie local? Le- our listeners, oh, you know Stephanie? what? I don't know. Okay. I'd have to look that up, but I don't know. Uh, Leah was born in 1976 in Durham, North Carolina. She was the third child to Nancy and Stancil. I think that's how you say that, Roberts. She had two older siblings, Heath and Kara. I don't know how much older. I think Kara is like two years older than her, but I don't know where Heath falls, if he's older than that or middle. When Leah was still in high school and 17, her dad was diagnosed with a life-threatening lung disease. In 1995, Leah began college at NC State. Hello, go Wolfpack. Yes, Wolfpack. Studying Spanish and anthropology. Wow. Interesting. Very intriguing majors. About a year into college, Leah's mother dies unexpectedly from heart disease. So her dad was diagnosed wow. with this life-threatening lung disease, and her mom was really, I mean, dying silently because that's like the silent killer, that, you know, heart disease. And so, like, she was dealing with that, but nobody knew that's what was, you know, what was going on with her. So she dies unexpectedly. So Leah took a little time off to grieve this loss, but then returned to school in 1998. Not long after she returned to school, she was involved in a serious car accident where she ended up with a punctured lung and shattered femur. Good and she had to Lord. Have a, I know. She like so much. She ended up having to have a metal rod put in that I read in one article, and now I don't remember the exact wording, that was like the length of her entire leg or like the length of like the top portion. I can't, okay. I can't remember how long it is. But way, it's long. Ow. Either way, it's a long metal rod that's in her leg. So needless to say, after these two events, she started to kind of like look at life a little bit different, not wanting to take advantage of any time she has left on this earth. She decided to study a semester abroad in Spain, and not long after that, she was planning to do a field study in Costa Rica. Cool. Yes, very cool. Just before she was to leave for Costa Rica, her father succumbed to that lung disease that he had been battling for years in 1999. After the loss of her father, she was faced with the decision of whether or not she should still go to Costa Rica because I think it was like a month before Mm -hmm. she was supposed to go that he passed. But she decides that she's going to go. And actually, a couple of her friends um, mentioned in some interviews that like, it kind of seemed like she wasn't really dealing with his loss. Like maybe there had just been so much that had happened that she just kind of shut down and she was like, I'm going to Costa Rica. And it just seemed like she was just going about Hmm. doing her life like nothing happened. I don't know if that's the case, but that's what they were suggesting. Very understandable. Yes, I know. Mom dies. She gets in a serious car accident. Now her dad's gone. Like, Well, and I she's can't so young and now has lost both of her parents. And she's just a right. college student. That is heavy. That's hard. Yeah. I can understand how you would feel like you needed to like preserve yourself by shutting down. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Not long after she returns from Costa Rica in 2000, just a few credits shy of graduating with her degree in Spanish and anthropology, Leah drops out of college. Her siblings tried to convince her to stick it out for six more months, but she just was like, nope, I'm not having that. I'm not doing it. Hmm. She really wanted to find herself. I know. I don't know why, why you wouldn't if you're that close. I mean, 
it was literally, they said, I don't know how exactly, but a few credits and they're saying six months and she would have been done. So I don't, but I don't know. Leah, Leah's Leah. She really wanted to find herself and deal with all of the loss that occurred in her life. She just couldn't move past it all. And this is what she felt that she was supposed to do at the time. Okay. She had the desire to start taking guitar lessons and started dabbling in photography. Um, she was also known to do a lot of journaling and to help her cope with all of the loss in her life. And she also adopted a kitten that she named B. Oh. She lived, yeah. It's my she nickname, lived in Raleigh. B? Mm-hmm. Really? Yeah, I don't that's think what I knew that. All my friends from back in school called me. Oh. And some of I mean, them still makes, do. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense. It's the first letter. Or, I mean, not, but anyway, but yeah, B. And I, I didn't know that. Yeah, cool. She lived in Raleigh with her roommate, Nicole, and was just going to live off of her inheritance for a bit while she pondered the meaning of life. She was described by many people as an old soul. And if you kind of see that in her in some of the pictures that there are out there, like, you know, her in like these coffee shops with a hat on and like, anyway, it's like you can kind of see that, that she seems like she's She sounds awesome. She does. And all of the – like, I'm not kidding you. Not that – there's people out there that aren't cute, but like in all pictures, but literally every picture you see of her, you're like, oh my gosh, she's so cute. And she has like this pixie cut in one or like a bob in another, like long hair, you know, like, but she always looks super cute, you know, so mm-hmm. people are like, oh, that doesn't look good on you. It's like, no matter what, it looks good on her. <laughs> so, <laughs> cute. She's cute. So she would also write about all of like the meaning of life in her journals. She started hanging out at a local coffee shop alone, reading and writing in her journal. She had a fascination with the writer Jack Kerouac, which I know that I've heard that name, but I don't really know if I knew who he was. Do you know who he is? I don't think so. He's an American writer and poet, and he's considered one of the pioneers of the beat generation, which I also did not know (laughs) what that was. So I had to look that up. Okay. It's a movement of authors who influenced American culture and politics post-war, and their stuff was popular, like, in the 1950s. Wow. Anyways, she was, like, obsessed with him. Okay. One of the things he wrote about was beautiful scenery and just being on the road, and Leah loved one of his books called Dharma Buns. Bums, not buns. My mind's in the gutter, apparently. (laughs) Dharma Bums. I don't know anything about that book. I didn't even look it up, so I have no clue. But that's her favorite book. And she made a friend named Janine at the coffee house who was also a fan of this book. And they would just sit and chat, drink coffee, and talk about Jack Kerouac. They would often talk about traveling outside, out to the West, and seeing the mountain range that Jack wrote about in that particular book. Very cool. Yes. Yes. So some of her friends now feel like she's kind of pulling away from them because she's going to these places by herself, making different friends and not really hanging out with them as much. So they're just, they're like concerned, uh, not concerned, but just a little bit like, hmm, what's going on? Like, why, why isn't she hanging out? Yeah. Where's Leah? Yeah. In March of 2000, Leah is about to embark on an adventure and will not tell anyone what she's about to do. Oh. And after this quick little break, I will explain what I mean by that. On March 9th, 2000, Leah spoke with her sister on the phone, as they usually would. They chatted for a while and then said they would need to get together soon. No, like, specific plans, just generic, uh, we really should just get together soon. So mm-hmm. let's, let's plan on that. Leah then made plans with her roommate, Nicole, to babysit the following night on Friday, which I guess wasn't something unusual. This was just something maybe they did. Like, maybe Nicole got a call and she'd be like, hey, do you want to come with me? And that would Leah oh, okay. would just go and like hang out with her too. So Friday night, Leah did not show up for the babysitting job, which apparently was not a big deal to Nicole because she was just kind of coming to keep her company, like I said. And so when Nicole went home, Leah's car, which by the way, is a white Jeep Cherokee, just for like reference, was not there and neither was Leah. This also did not concern her because it was not uncommon for the two not to see each other for days with them coming and going, especially with Leah being such a free spirit and not like having a job and like just kind of doing her own thing all the time. So okay. she wasn't super concerned. She was kind of like, why didn't she call me and tell me that she wasn't coming? But was still like, she's a grown up. She, she can do what she wants. Right. 
Two days pass, and phone calls start coming in from other friends saying that Leah has not shown up for plans that they made together. Oh, no. So on Sunday, March 12th, Nicole calls Leah's sister, Kara, and lets her know what was going on. Like, she didn't come Friday night. Now everyone's calling me saying she's not showing up for this. So what What do you want to do? So the two call the, all people that they know that they can think of and ask if they've heard or seen Leah, and no one has. Mm-hmm. So on Monday, which is now the 13th, Nicole and Kara meet to talk about what they do next, and Kara goes into Leah's room to take a look around. There are things missing, but just looks like she willingly packed up a bag and her cat and left and hit the road. So she, again, wasn't super concerned because she's thinking like all the things that she talks about and says, and she's like, well, so like she can go somewhere. Mm-hmm. I mean, I And she took the that cat. She Right, exactly. Which is Dr. Cat up. Right. Yeah. So she ends up deciding to call the police, though, because she is concerned that Leah's got possibly like her mental state isn't where it needs to be. And so, considering that she didn't like call her or tell anybody what she was doing, she was like, well, that's a little bit concerning. So let's just put it out there that she's a missing person. Everything that she's been through, maybe she's depressed and not thinking clearly. So let's make a report. So they do that. On Tuesday, March 14th, Kara goes back to the house and takes another look in Leah's room. She finds a note that Leah left for her roommate. Why it wasn't found the first day, I don't know. Maybe they just kind of walked in to see if like things were like astray and whatever. And they were like, no, not really. She just looked like she packed up and left. And mm-hmm. then left. So but anyway, this time she takes a look and she finds this note. On the outside is a hand-drawn picture of the Cheshire cat smile, you know, from Alice in Wonderland. Yes. Uh-huh. Which might sound and like seem a little creepy, but apparently um, Leah is like a huge Alice in Wonderland fan. So that's, you know, just her doodling on this note. That movie is trippy. Oh, it is. Like to watch it as an adult, it's like, what is happening? (laughs) Yeah. Like the original? Yeah. Because there's also that Johnny Depp one that I have not watched, which I I would imagine is probably even more trippy. Yeah, it definitely is. Strange. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Because even his like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory remake was weird. Yes. (laughs) Anyway, in the note, she tells Nicole that she's going to take a trip. She says, tell Kara, I'm not depressed. I'm far from it. I'm not suicidal, but I just had to leave. Wow. Don't worry about me, basically. Here you go. She also mentions Jack Kerouac and references the book On the Road, which is another book. And she leaves money within this note that basically is enough to cover about a month's worth of bills. So they're thinking, okay, well, I guess she's got a plan and she's got to do this. So And she'll be back in a month. And she'll be back in a month, most likely. So at this point, it's super strange that she would leave and not tell anyone. But that's really the only thing that's strange. Like, everything looks fine. She left this note. She left money. And she's an adult, so she can make these decisions for herself. And considering everything she'd been through in life, well, everyone's I was thinking say, she just needs some time. Although she's never done anything like this before, it's not necessarily out of character for her considering everything right yes that she went through and the type of person that she's this old soul that enjoys you know jack kerouac and like the thought of taking an adventure out west all that kind of stuff like that right Mm -hmm. okay so there's not a whole lot to go on so far except for that stuff like they have no idea where she's going but we do catch a break so you remember when leo went to costa rica Mm -hmm. right before she left she made kara her power of attorney, just in case something happened to her while she was out of the country. Okay. So Kara is still a power of attorney, so she can gain access to her bank records very easily. Nice. Okay. She, Ooh, which should Kara I make is, you like, my power smart. of attorney? Right. We should I'm definitely saying. be making someone. <laughs> <laughs> well, it'd be also our spouse to- automatically, but yeah. well, yes, exactly. Well, yeah, but in case both of you go. Well, true. And I want somebody smart. I want somebody investigative. So who's going to think of this? Like, oh, wait, let me look at her bank. Uh huh. What happens? Exactly. Yeah. So also, we need to hire Kara, or at least get in the on the phone with her and be like, "You want to help us with some cases here?" Yeah. (laughs) Nice. (laughs) Call us, Kara. Yeah, call us, Kara. So she gains access to her bank records, and she sees that on the day she spoke to Leah on the phone. Leah went to the bank and withdrew $3,000 from her account. Okay. That's a lot. She sees that she also, yes, got gas. 
and is thinking, so based on when she got gas, she's thinking she left town around 6 p.m. that night. I mean, she's freaking super sleuth here. She has a transaction for a hotel in Memphis, Tennessee on March 10th, and then tracks other transactions such as gas stations and what and whatnot. Based on this, she can tell that she's traveling west on I-40, and she just keeps on going. Okay. Nice, nice. The last transaction was made at a gas station in Brooks, Oregon on March 13th. So she's made it across the country Mm -hmm. in like three days. Wow. So nonstop traveling essentially. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. And no other hotel stays that we know of Mm -hmm. because she saw the once. It's like, well, she she must have been sleeping in her car. Well, she paid cash too. She could have paid cash or something. Well, you – Yes, that would be my thought, except you'll see later that I don't think it's possible that she paid cash based on the amount of money that was still in her car. Okay, got it. (laughs) So after that last transaction in Brooks, Oregon for gas on the 13th, there's just nothing. Nothing happens to her bank at all. Hmm. Statements. Her roommate goes to the coffee shop that Leah hung out at and spoke with that friend Janine that she had hung out with talking about Jack Kerouac. And Janine told her, well, she's always had this dream about traveling out west of the mountains that Jack spoke of in this book. So they're like, well, that makes sense. She's Oregon. So maybe she's head up to, I think it was in Washington where he would speak of. So they have an idea of where she's going and why she went. I want to find myself. I'm obsessed with this guy. I'm going. So they just hope that at some point they will hear from Leah mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so that they can ask her some questions when she's ready. On March 19th, Kara was hoping to hear from Leah as it was her 26th birthday. She thought, well, if anything, she's going to call me on that day. So, Wait, it's Kara's birthday? Kara's birthday, okay. the sister. Okay. So she's hoping, well, I, she'll probably for sure call me on, the, on that day. Mm-hmm. Instead, she came home to a letter in her front door from the local police instructing her to call an officer at the Bellingham Police Department because Leah's car has been found. Oh, no. Bellingham is in Washington, if you don't know. She made it to Washington, okay. Yes. It's like northwest, which I think I mentioned this later, so I'll have to skip over, but it's like northwest Washington, way north, because I went there. I have a roommate in college. I had a roommate in college that was from Linden, which is like super north. Mm -hmm. Um, We actually went to Canada for lunch one day because that's how close it was to the Canadian border. And that's like just north of Bellingham. Okay. So anyway. Okay. So the day before on March 18th, because she got that letter on the 19th, a couple was out jogging when they came across a few article of, of articles of clothing like hanging from trees because they were you know, on like a path in the woods. Mm-hmm. So they peered down this ravine and saw some more stuff scattered. And so they go down and they find a passport and a white Jeep Cherokee at the bottom of the ravine. And it's found off of a logging road, um, off a logging road off Canyon Creek Road, which is about 38 miles east of Bellingham. Okay. East. Point the wrong direction. When you say in a ravine, was it driven in the ravine or did it fall in a ravine? It was driven. And we'll be explaining that in a second. Got it. So they find the car. They call police. Police go and check it out. There's a ton of stuff in the car, just all strewn about, about, looks totally as if it had been like flipped and all this stuff just kind of like went flying as it was flipping down the ravine. The car was badly damaged. No sign of anyone being in the car or getting out of the car. Cause you would think if they got out, they would have busted like the windows out totally, or like opened the door, not necessarily thought to close it, (laughs) you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it didn't look like anybody had gotten out of the car. Okay. But weirdly there are pillows and blankets in the windows as it's, as if someone had been using it for shelter at some point. So, it could be that somebody was in there and was using it for shelter after the accident, or was that for when she was like sleeping in her car during her road trip? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, I don't know. Who knows? It has North Carolina plates on it. And so that's how they end up linking it clearly to the missing persons report in Raleigh. And so they call the Raleigh PD, who then sends the officer out to let Kara know. And that, but she wasn't home, so they left a note. Two days later, Kara and Heath are on a plane out to Washington to help figure this out. Wow. As, yeah, they're going. And there was a, there was actual like short footage of them like going to the scene of where the car was found and just kind of like walking around and checking things out. Like I, I can't even imagine. As police are investigating and looking at the car, they determine based on the damage to the trees, the tracks, et cetera, the car must have been going up the hill. Like so they knew what direction it was going in. 
and about 30 to 40 miles per hour when it went off the side of the road into the ravine. Okay. It went off and the embankment without trying to stop, essentially. They said if someone was inside the car, they would be very hurt or possibly even like tossed out. But of course, they don't see anything like anywhere close by. While looking inside the vehicle, they start to think no one was in the car when it went off the side of the road. There is no like, and the reason for this is because there's no point of impact like on the windshield. So like if somebody had like hit the windshield or like a a window, which you Mm -hmm. probably would have if you'd been in it, there's no like indentation that says, oh, Mm -hmm. somebody was in the car. Mm -hmm. There's no blood in the car. Okay. You would assume if somebody was being tossed around in there, that there would be blood. No damage to the steering wheel, which also would be something like a point of impact for somebody. And also the seatbelt was not strained as if somebody was like in it. You know, if you were like being tossed around, this seatbelt would have been like all sorts of, you know, stressed out, I guess. So inside the car, they found clothes, the cat box, a checkbook, CDs, her guitar, all things that they would expect expect to find in there based on what her sister had said that she left home with. But the cat was nowhere in sight either. Um, Police checked at surrounding hospitals for possible like disoriented women being treated Mm -hmm. like during the time of that, but there were no reports of that past the day that um, the, uh, the car was found. Okay. So like there, there was one like that day, but they don't think that it was probably her because that would have been like quick for her to like get out of there and find her way to a hospital. Mm-hmm. They did get video footage from the gas station that she stopped at in Oregon. And it shows Leah in the store paying. She looked in good shape, dressed n- normally, had a hat on, nothing super out of the ordinary. One weird thing that was while she was waiting to pay the cashier. She was like peering out the window at something. It was so, it was like, she walked up, you could see her walk up, put like her stuff on the counter and then take a couple steps back and like, look out the window and like, look at something. Okay. Some have speculated that she was looking at someone, mm-hmm. but in my head, I was like, well, is she just looking like to see like what pump number she was at? Cause you know, if you forget that when you oh, go in, yeah. you're like, Oh, let me check. So, I, I mean, I feel like that could be a plausible thing. Or even if she is checking on her cat. Oh, true. Like, oh, I left the cat in the car. Like, well, let me make sure I can still yeah. see him or make sure I didn't leave the window open or exactly. whatever. That's true. I didn't even think about that. So, so that was around 1 a.m. on March 13th. And Bellingham is about a five to six hour drive from there. So if she continued on... Immediately, she would have been there like early in the morning Mm -hmm. and really been there kind of like in the afternoon. And we know this because in the car they found a ticket stub, which um, the person who was interviewed said it was like in like a memory box. So she had a box that she was like putting things in. Okay. Which makes sense for like this like trip across country to find yourself. I'm going to, I want to remember all the things that I did. So they found in this box a ticket stub that she had bought for that afternoon, the 13th. For the show American Beauty. Oh, so, like the movie? You know, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, the movie. Also a weird movie. I, I don't think I've ever seen it. Isn't that the one with Kevin Spacey? Like all the flowers and that's weird. It's a weird movie if that's the one know. I'm thinking of. I don't know, but I don't, I don't think I've, I know I've heard of this movie, but I don't feel like I've ever seen it. So, yeah. So it was for an afternoon showing. So no one at the theater specifically remembers seeing her, but it's assumed that she went. But they're thinking, okay, so she made the drive. She's there in the morning. She had to do something until this movie started. So she had to be going around Bellingham, this little town. Mm -hmm. So maybe somebody remembers seeing her. So when they were at the theater, which is kind of near the mall or inside a mall, it's, you know, how theaters usually are by a mall. Kara goes, decides to go through the mall thinking, well, maybe she went in to like grab a bite to eat before or after the movie. Mm -hmm. And she would probably kind of be like, oh, I, she'd go to somewhere like that, you know. So right. Let me take a look. So she noticed that there was one sit-down restaurant in that mall. And she was like, that's definitely a place that she would go to eat, which she knows her sister well. Because when they questioned the employees, Leah had been there that wow. day. Wow. Kara. Right? See? So I'm saying we need to talk to Kara. She, Leah sat at the bar and there were two patrons on either side of her that people remember seeing. And she would like 
chat with them every now and then. She wasn't there with them, but they were there. And so they would, were just ch- talking, making small talk. So um, when they track these two guys down, one of them tells police that she was warm, talkative, sharing things about her life. And the person on the other side of her said similar things about her and also mentioned that she had spoke of Jack Kerouac. So they're like, well, she's still Mrs. Kara. Or definitely Leah. her. Yep. Yeah, definitely Leah. This man says that she left with another man named Barry and gives a description of the guy. And they like draw up a whole rendering of this guy. And But no one else mentions this guy. And as a matter of fact, the other guy that was sitting on the other side of her says that she, he saw her leave alone. Okay. So police are kind of like, um, do we believe this guy? Does he have any credibility? Like, why is he lying to us mm-hmm. if he's lying or somebody's lying? Like one of them. He, she either left alone or she left with someone. One of these guys is lying. Yes. But for whatever reason, they think it's the guy that said she left with Barry. That's lying. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, because he's given himself an alibi. Yeah, right? That's that's what you think. Yes, exactly. So about three weeks later, they're going through items in the car again and looking inside the car. This is where I was telling you about the money. They find about twenty four to $2,500 in the car. It's okay. said both ways, so I don't know which one's accurate. So that's only five to $600. And in a, it was in a pocket of her pants. So she hasn't spent much money because she took $3,000 out and she left some for the roommate for a month. So you think that like that five oh. to $600 is what she left her. So I don't know that she used any cash at all. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. She'd been using her debit card for gas and stuff like that. So it doesn't seem like she's used any cash. Mm -hmm. So there's where we say she didn't stay at any other hotels on the way. Did she use (sighs) cash to buy the movie ticket? Because we know she she bought that. Right. Okay. She must have. And she must have paid cash for um, that meal. Yeah. Yeah. Because those are the two things that we know she did that were not on the bank statement. Because the last one was that gas station. Okay. So... Also, under the floorboard of the car, they found an engagement ring, which is later identified as Leah's mother's ring. Apparently, that ring meant the world to her, and she never took it off. And one friend actually said that the only scenario she could see Leah not having it on is if she completely forgot who she was. Like, this was something she would not take off. Hmm. But it's underneath the floorboard of the car. And I don't know how it would get there. Yeah. It's almost like she even hit if it, it was, there or something. Right. Not on her – like if she took it off driving and it was in the cup holder, like I don't know how it would get under the floorboard. Mm-hmm. Like that to me is like it was put under there. So they decide to lead a cert- search team within a radius of the scene that they thought if someone survived this accident, this is where we think they would get to <laughs> or wherever. This is the directions they would go in and this is how far we think they would get. But nothing comes of that. Nothing is found that connects to Leah at all. At this point, the case just starts to go cold. There's no leads coming in. Nothing's leading them to search anything further. So at some point, the police contact Kara and they're like, okay, it's been a long time. We have no more leads. We're not like closing this, but what do you want us to do with the car? We feel like we've, you know, done what we can with it. What should we do with it? And in in interviews, Kara... This is why I keep saying we need to talk to her. She's like, I've heard so many cases that get solved years down the line because somebody's like, oh, we didn't look at this or we overlooked this. So, and then all of a sudden things get solved. So she's like, nope, keep it, store it. I don't want you to get rid of it. Right. Don't, don't get rid of it. Yeah, so they don't. Put it in a giant evidence locker. Yeah. The, the car. <laughs> Apparently it's like kept in this like secure, like, I don't, I don't know, gated probably where they keep other evidence that's big and giant like cars. Right. <laughs> so they do keep it. So here's where we jump lots of years down the road. Oh, no. Almost, where's Leah? Almost, we're almost seven years to be exact. In December of 2006, this case is still not solved. The original investigator is now retiring, so he passes the case and the files down to some fresh eyes. As they're going through the files and evidence, they realize that there were parts of the car that had, had not been examined. Hello, ding, 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 Kara. Mm-hmm. No one had ever looked under the hood. Don't know why. Okay. They never popped the hood. When they opened it, they realized that the cover on the starter relay had been removed and it was cut. This would allow the car to start from the outside and also accelerate on its own. 
Oh my gosh. Uh huh. Which now makes their theory that no one was in the car when it went over the embankment make sense. Because if someone could start it from the outside and let it go and it would accelerate up to 30 or 40 miles an hour before it went over, no one has to be in the car. If this thing is okay, okay, broken. okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Did they so they also find it fingerprints <laughs> under the hood. Me and Kara. And me and Kara. Me and Kara. <laughs> and male DNA on one article of clothing wow. inside the car. Because I don't know how much DNA. Well, I guess, I mean, it was only 99, 2000. So, like, I don't know. When did DNA stuff really start to ramp up? Uh, in the 90s. Yeah, so I don't know why this wasn't found initially, right? Unless, unless because it, it didn't really look like anything but an accident to them initially. They were just like, "Well, she was in the car by herself somehow, or some, you know, whatever." So anyway, they remember the guy that they interviewed that sat next to her at the bar. Uh huh. Uh-huh. Well, not remembered, but they re- read about him in the file. And he had at some point this guy had worked as a mechanic. Well, look at that. Look at that. And was also in the military. So then they were like, oh, this guy sounds a little bit more suspicious now than he probably did back in the day. So they wanted to find him again and get his prints and his DNA. <clears throat> it took him a little bit to find him because he had moved to Canada within these years. Mm-hmm. which also complicated getting his fingerprints and the DNA, but they did contact the Canadian authorities and ask them to get it for them. But it took two years for them wow. to get it. Wow. Why? So, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what the what – the, um, complications were, but it's like they have to go through the Canadian government, I guess. And like, I'm sure there's like papers that has to happen. And then like, he has to agree. Like, I mean, well, not necessarily if they have a warrant for it, but anyway. Well, but I don't know how it works between Canada. Like if now he's a Canadian citizen, like can they, can Canada force him? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like, I don't know. Right. No, for sure. I I don't know. I don't know. But it took them two years. But when they finally get it, it's not a match. Oh, no. It's not his fingerprint. Who knows? Truly, the fingerprints under the hood could have been some mechanic that worked on her car before she even left, you know? Like, who knows when that was put there? But anyway, it's not a match either way. So this guy, like, they're now like, well, I guess he's he's clear. The male DNA on her clothes doesn't make a whole lot of sense and I know is in the system, but there has not been any reports since saying that they were going to start testing stuff on if they found a match. So I'm guessing there hasn't been a match because clearly if there was, there there would have been something written. Right. Like, oh, his DNA match just, just wasn't his fingerprint. Okay. But I don't think anything of his match. So I think it's just like now it's in the system and now we can compare it to DNA at any point. And if there's a match, then we may someday solve this. Right. Oh, my gosh. But this is where it ends. Legitimately. Nothing. Wow. Since all that. Like, there's nothing left. I will. So it's like she disappeared into thin air, like Jody Lynn. Like she was at a place, people saw her, and then nobody did. Like again, she was at places, people saw her, and then all of a sudden nobody did. <laughs> like, except there's a car in this instance where Jody Lynn. Yeah, there's working. quite a bit of evidence in this. In Jody Lynn's, there was nothing. This has. Yeah, there's, yeah. Like at least we have a trail of some sort we can explain. I mean, in my opinion, she's not running because mm. she. It's weird the cat was gone though, right? Mm-hmm. Isn't that weird? Mm-hmm. But she's mm-hmm. not running because she's using the debit card and she knows, like, I mean, this is, I'm sure she was aware that paper trails are paper trails by this time. Right. Yeah, you would think. You would think. I will say this. She has that metal rod on her leg. So it, that has a serial number connected to it that is connected to her because they, they like, log that stuff right so if a body's ever found with this they'll know it's her Uh like even if they can't identify it in any other way they'll know or if this rod is found anywhere like you know she did die and was eaten by an animal and the only thing left is a rod like Mm -hmm. well this rod will show up at some point and the thing is if somebody did kill her right okay so if there's foul play and somebody killed her this is a stranger a crime of opportunity Mm -hmm. of some sort that person's not gonna know she's got a metal rod in her leg Right. So it's not like they're going to be like, oh, we got to dispose of the, of the rod or, you know, whatever. Like, right. Where right. is she? Yeah. I don't know. So I watched a couple of shows on this, one being Unsolved Mysteries and the other one was called Disappeared. 
I really, I, I mean, unsolved mysteries clearly is just like, they just do like little snippets of, you know, things, but the disappeared was just all on her. It's very interesting. I got most of my information from there actually. And the unsolved mysteries was with Rob was with Robert Stack. So it was kind nice. of fun to see the old and listen to that guy's voice again. <laughs> yeah. So at the end of the story, they gave three possible theories mentioned. Okay. One, she drove off the road, survived, was in the middle of nowhere when she was trying to find her way out. And so she like climbs out of this ravine, hitchhikes, and becomes prey for a serial killer or murderer. No, I don't think that's what happened to her. Right. Two, she survives the crash with internal injuries, and that's why there's no blood anywhere. But she has no memory of who she is or where she's from, and so she's just wandering around somewhere out there and just doesn't have any memory of it. Hmm. Or three, she left her life behind and crashed her car to make it look like she didn't make it. This one, the family, like you, doesn't believe that she did. One, I mean, well, yeah, like, where was the cat? Like, that's one reason. I mean, mm-hmm. that's one reason mm-hmm. that I don't think. Because, I mean, you if you, you're not going to take the dead cat with you. <laughs> yeah. You know, like, if. That would be the only thing that the cat wouldn't be there. Like if the cat, if she survived and the cat survived, she took the cat. Mm-hmm. But if the cat died on the thing, she, anyway, I don't know. This, that was a random thing. But anyways, so the family does not believe that this is what happened basically because her sister's like, I can't imagine that after we lost our mom and our dad, that Leah would then like leave us to deal with this loss mm-hmm. of her, like purposefully and just right. like disappear without saying anything. Right. I feel like if she wanted to just go start over somewhere, she'd be like, listen, I got to do this. If I don't get in touch with you for a really long time, just understand it's what I need to do. Like something. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's not like they weren't close. They talked. They hung out. They right. lived near each other. Like so, they don't believe that third one at all. That she just left her her um, life behind and crashed her car on purpose is like one final hurrah. I think act. somebody got a hold of her. I right? think somebody got a hold of her, and possibly they were in the, her car together, and that's why she took her ring off and hid it because she was like this dude's about to kill me or what, you know, and like, I'm going to leave this ring here because I want them to know that I did this on purpose, like that I was under yeah. duress or whatever. And then they took the car down the hill to like make it look like she died in an accident. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I agree with that. I think something happened to her before that car went off and like she you did like you said she put it there it was like a breadcrumb for her exactly leave that right there i mean and nothing was taken like besides the cat like well and would it, would somebody who got a hold of her take the cat or you think the cat just ran off well, right yeah i don't know they probably just let the cat go like go away cat you know i mean yeah i guess there's no way to like oh this stray cat looks like leah's <laughs> Right. To identify this cat unless she's got it like chipped or something. Right. Which they probably didn't do that long ago. That is an interesting one. Right? Yeah. So there you have it. I'm here for that breadcrumb thing, though. I think that's what happened. Because here's the thing. Kara is super smart. And they're sisters. So, like, Mm -hmm. Leah's going to be a smarty pants as well. Wouldn't be surprised if they watched a little Unsolved Mysteries together as kids. So exactly. They were into that stuff together. Exactly. <laughs> wow. That's really interesting. I have never heard of that at all. Not one ounce, which is surprising Yeah, to me because it sounds like a pretty covered case. Right. Yeah. Really, oh, I will say, sorry. Mystery. There was one other thing that happened. I feel like it was... A couple days after the car was found, somebody called the police station and said that him and his wife, or he, I don't remember exactly, saw a woman matching her description in whatever city um, close by that looked very disoriented. But then not long after he made that statement, he got spooked and like hung up the phone. And they have not been able to like follow up with that. Hmm. essentially really because they don't know who this guy is they don't like he didn't leave a number or whatever so i'm sure that they like followed up in terms of like going to this city that he said Mm -hmm. that she was in but like not finding her but so there's like another like if that was her and she had made it somewhere else and she was disoriented maybe she did like survive it and isn't doesn't remember who she is Mm -hmm. but i don't know Mm -hmm. and that's like or maybe the killer is the one that called and he was trying to put her somewhere else yeah. Like throw yeah, people off the trail. Yeah. 
True. Very true. Oh my gosh. You guys have to let us know what you think happened to Leah. Yes, please. I feel like mm-hmm. I've, I feel like I have my theory, but man, it's so tra- I can't imagine if this happened to my sister. Like I kind of want to call her today and be like, my sister's name is Leah too. And be like, Hey, if you go missing, I will kill you. <laughs> you please call me if you're planning on leaving. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a long road trip. <laughs> but also leave me breadcrumbs under the floorboards, okay? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do that, please. Thanks. Yes. <laughs> and can I be your power of attorney? Anyway, <laughs> a lot. It's a lot to unpack. I yeah. That was a good ride. I was interesting. I'm so sad for her family that I can't imagine. Yeah, I am too. Good case. Good Kara, case. Call us, though. Call us, Kara, if you Yeah. <laughs> I think you might be one of us. <laughs> Crimes and closets at gmail.com. Yes. <laughs> Closet sister. <laughs> wow. I hope she gets answers one day. I can't even imagine. But all right. So Stephanie, thanks for the suggestion. Yes. That was great. Um, don't forget to come find us on social media and see all the things and interact with us. Let us know your theories on this case. If you want more of your girls at Crimes and Closets, we have a Patreon. You can find that link on all of our stuff and we'll see you next week and always remember the world is scary people suck hide in your closet